Freedom means self-determination. It's the ability to choose. And I think that that's what we all should have a right to, and that's what we're all fighting for. Public debate is vital in a democratic society because if the public doesn't take part, then the politicians take over and decide everything for themselves. And a place like the Bali is important because that's where the public gets to say what they think and shape their opinions and listen to debate. It's incredibly important that people continue to speak out in this way. Acknowledge the limitations and taking responsibility for questioning the limitations. With knowledge comes a certain beauty. We are then in a position to take action on that. Particularly in this very noisy, fast culture, what documentary does, I think, is to take time to make meaning. Documentaire films and kunst in het algemeen is soms een plek waar de mening en waar de positie belangeloos is. Je mag er gewoon zijn, je mag leren en de Bali is zo'n plek. Hallo, welkom everybody, welkom in de Bali en welkom to the programma Chantal Mouffe for Left Populism. En also welkom to those people who watch via our livestream. Um, my name is Marlijn Geurts, I'm program editor in the Bali, and I have the honor tonight to introduce our special guests of tonight, Chantal Mouf. Uh, she has been here almost two years, uh, more than two years ago, in the Bali during the Forum on European Culture. And I think it's great that we have her again because I think her ideas about the political system and about democracy are super intriguing and also very important if we look at the Europe of today. Uh, a couple of months ago, she published her most recent book, For Left Populism in which she, uh, contrary to all people who see populism as a perversion of democracy, uh, defines populism as an adequate political, political force. And tonight uh, she will present her new book and I'll, I'll tell us about what is left populism and why we are in need of it. Um, she will give a speech for about 30 minutes and afterwards uh, moderator Alicia Kuczynka uh, will have an interview with her. Uh, Alicia Kuczynka is a Polish-Flemish philosopher, writer and interviewer. And of course, there's also room for your questions. Uh, please note that we don't have time for whole essays or statements. So please keep your uh, questions a bit short and a bit clear so that everybody can understand them. And uh, very important that they have a question mark at the end. Um, I think it's time to introduce our main guest of tonight. Give her a very warm welcome, philosopher, political scientist and writer, Chantal Mouffe. Technical incident. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Hey, good evening. It's nice to be back at the Bailey um, to introduce you the idea I developed in the book. By the way, um, the book is. Just about to come out in Dutch, is it? Yes. In fact, we were hoping that some copies would be ready for today, but there is also a little uh, delay. <laughs> but if you are interested, uh, I'm not going to tell you everything which is in the book because I want you to <laughs> still want to buy it, of course. <laughs> but I'm going to give you an idea of what are the main uh, theses that I defend in that book. Uh, so my aim in for left populism, is to inquire into the kind of political strategy that the left should implement in the present conjuncture in Western Europe. So it is a, clearly a political intervention in a specific conjuncture, right? the conjuncture that we are living today in Western Europe. And I call that, and I'm going to de develop that moment, that we are living in a populist moment. Uh, I argue precisely that this populist moment that we are living is the expression of resistances to what I call the post-democratic condition. I will explain that in a moment. Um, that is the result of 30 years of neoliberal hegemony. 
Today, this neoliberal hegemony is entering into crisis. That is, for me, something that is very clear. Of course, people can disagree with that, but I think we are living a crisis of neoliberal hegemony. Uh, and I insist, neoliberal hegemony, not necessarily the neoliberal you know, economic system. I'm not saying that we are going to have a big uh, economic crash um, very soon. But it's the idea, the hegemony of neoliberalism, because till not long ago, uh, well, so Fukuyama, that was here last week, apparently, had declared, uh, you remember that, the end of history and the big, uh, that uh, now with neoliberalism uh, we had uh, um, reached a fantastic, mar marvelous uh, solution to the problems. And a um, lot of people, in fact, agree with that for a certain time. Um, we were told that there was no alternative to neoliberal globalization, and as I'm going to argue, one of the main problems was that social democratic parties, you know, they, uh, agree, agree with that. Um, and of course, still, I will say 2008, because the crisis of 2008 was the end of this belief that you no, know, we had found a solution to the problems, and you know, that uh, basically Anglo-Saxon capitalism was going to bring. Uh, peace, prosperity to, to the world. Uh, so this is, to, today I think this definitively is in the crisis, this idea. Um, and we have entered a period of what Gramsci called an interregnum. That is something that the past is dying, there is a crisis, but we still don't really have an alternative, you know? So this, this is a moment which is between crisis of neoliberalism, but it's not clear what will be the alternative. The outcome of this crisis is at the moment undecided. Uh, so I think that we are in a particularly crucial moment uh, because this crisis could lead to more authoritarian regimes that are going to restrict democracy if right-wing populism are going to win, but it's also the opportunity for uh, recovering and an extension of democracy if, on the contrary, left-wing populism uh, are the one who bring the issue to the crisis. Because I think that to bring about a progressive outcome to this crisis, a progressive outcome that will lead to a radicalization of democracy, the strategy that the left need to use is a strategy which I call left populism. I want to clarify straight away that when, what I mean when I'm speaking of populism, because as you know, no, it is, it is such an inflation of the term populism. Everything you know is populism, and everything that people don't like that's populist, populist. So obviously we can't. Uh, be understand exactly what it means anymore, populism. But I'm using populism in a very specific way. And here I'm following the analytical approach developed by Ernesto Laclau, his, uh, his book called The Populist Reason. Because I think that uh, this approach helps us to envisage the question of populism in an analytical way, and that really helps us to make sense of what's happening. And he, in this book, defined populism a discursive strategy, populism is a strategy, of construction of the political frontier. And it's a strategy of construction of political frontier that uh, establish two camps, which are in confrontation, those from below, let's call that the people, and those from above, the, es the establishment, the ca la casta, the, the, the elites, as you want to call them. Um, so, I think that here it's important to insist on two things. But this understanding of populism locates itself already within a certain conception of what is the political a conception, which is called the dissociative conception. Because there, when you think what is the political, here I'm thinking of the political in a metapolitical uh, uh, understanding, uh, a reflection on the nature of the political. Um, there are two, basically two views. One which is called the associative conception of the political, according to which politics is the field of acting in common, is the field of liberty, and in the field where, in fact, we should the aim to establish consensus. Most of liberal political philosophy follow that, that line. 
But there is another conception, which is called the dissociative conception, according to which politics has to do with conflict. If there is politics, it's because there are, there, there are conflicts. So the political is understood as the, the, the place, the, the, the idea that society is divided. Divided in a way in which there will never be a possible complete reconciliation because they exist antagonism. Antagonism are conflict that cannot have a rational solution. You know, so this is a, a view that insists on the fact that politics is always partisan and that politics precisely consists in the establishment of a frontier between you know, the people, the establishment, that's the way constructed it. But it's not the only way to construct the frontier because there is also another way to construct the frontier that is usually more understood by people is the Marxist way of constructing the frontier, which is, yeah, there is an antagonism between the, the, the worker, the, the, the proletariat, and the bourgeoisie. As I was saying, for the liberal conception, there is no frontier. And the, the, that's absolutely uh, crucial. So there is no, no we them, because for me, and that's one of the thesis that I've developed most of my work, politics has always got to do with the construction of uh, us, we, and that necessarily requires the construction of uh, them. That's something, of course, that the, the, the liberals did not, uh, do not agree. Marxists agree with that, but they believe that is always, you know, the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. The way to construct the frontier in a populist way is to say, yes, they are antagonists, but it's not uniquely, I would say, because they are not saying that uh, uh, there's no antagonism between uh, the workers and the bourgeoisie, but it's not the only one. There are many more antagonists in society. And in fact, the, the frontier must be constructed in between the people and the establishment. So th this, I think, is important to realize that uh, when you think of populism, and constructing a frontier, you are automatically locating yourself into a dissociative conception. And uh, so conception of politics has got to do with partisan uh, uh, position. And Esther Laclau, in his book, insists that populism is not an ideology. It does not have a specific political orientation, because we are going to see an important difference between right-wing populism and left-wing populism. They've got in common of constructing a frontier, but, of course, when you say the, 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 the people, the, the, what is the people? It's always a political construction. And the, the them is also a political construction. And there are many different political ways uh, to construct this frontier. So this is why it can be you know, oriented towards uh, the right or towards the left. And probably more importantly, it's not a regime. When uh, the aim of a populist movement is not to establish a populist regime. And it's a strategy of construction of the frontier, but it's not a, a regime. And it can take many forms according to time and places. The populism in Latin America, for instance, is very different from the populism uh, in Western Europe or the populism that existed uh, in the US, it still exists today, uh, of course. Um, and uh, also very importantly, it is compatible with a variety of political institutions. So here what I'm going to argue is that the kind of populism that I defend is not a populism that put into question the institution of liberal democracy. Because we are very often told that, ah, you know, populism is against democracy. And it, it wants to, no. The, of course, there are some form of populism that can be constructed in that way. But constructing the populist frontier does not automatically put into question the democratic institution and even the liberal democratic institution. So this, those are uh, points that is very important to uh, insist in order to understand my argument. Now, let's come to what I understand exactly by the populist moment. Populist moment is the expression of a variety of resistances to the political and economic transformation which have taken place during the 30 years of neoliberal hegemony. Those transformations have led to a situation that we can call post-democracy. I was referring to that at the beginning. And by that, I want to indicate the erosion of the two main pillars of the democratic ideal. 
And those two main pillars are equality and popular sovereignty. This is what I speak of post-democracy. Uh, by the way, I'm not the one with coined that term. It was coined originally by um, Colin Crouch, uh, a British sociologist. Uh, Jacques Rancière also used it. Um, but they, and I, I agree with the way they use it, but my, my understanding of it is a little bit uh, more specific because I uh, insist precisely on the fact that is the two pillars of uh, democracy which have been eliminated uh, in our societies. And uh, this is what is at the origin of many resistances. People are f reacting to this you know, evacuation of the values of liberty, uh, of, of uh, equality and the values of popular sovereignty. In the, so that's what I call post-democracy. In the political arena, this evolution was made manif manifest through what I have proposed in a previous book, which, by the way, has been translated in Dutch too, called On the Political. I call that post-politics, to refer to the blurring of the political frontier between the right and the left. Uh, so by this term post-politics, I mean, in fact, the consensus which has been established between center-right and center-left parties on the idea that there was no alternative to neoliberal globalization. Under the pretext of modernization, as they pretend is imposed by globalization, social democratic parties have accepted the dictates of financial capitalism and the limit they impose on state intervention and on redistributive policies of the state. This is why politics has, in fact, become a mere technical issue of managing the established order, a domain reserved for experts. Because, of course, if there is no alternative, there is really no political decision to be made, it's basically a question you know, of uh, 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 management, of gestion, and political issues are, in fact, technical issues. And then, of course, it's better you know, that expert takes a, a decision about that. But why should the people you know, decide when those questions are te technical? This is why elections no longer offer real op opportunity to decide on real alternative through the traditional parties of government, center-right, center-left. The only thing that post-politics allows it's a bipartisan alternation in power between the center-right and the center-left parties. And all those who oppose what I've called the consensus at the center are perceived as extremists, and now they are uh, accused of being populist. So we could say that one of the fundamental pillars of the democratic ideal, you know, the power of the people, has been undermined because the people doesn't ever say anymore. Popular sovereignty, in fact, has been declared obsolete, and democracy has been reduced to its liberal component. In my book, and I don't have time to refer to that here, I insist on the fact that Western democracy, the way we understand democracy, is always an articulation between two different traditions, the liberal tradition and the democratic tradition. Liberal tradition, rule of law, separation of power, uh, uh, hum uh, human rights, Democratic tradition, as I've just said, equality and popular sovereignty. Uh, there is what I call an agonistic tension between those two uh, traditions, but it's something which I see as creative because it's there what allows for the possibility of pluralism. Uh, what has happened during those uh, years of neoliberal hegemony is that that tension has been eliminated because Everything which has got to do with the more democratic tradition has been left aside. And no, today is only the liberal tradition that uh, uh, reigns. And in fact, a very specific interpretation of that tradition, which is the one specific to neoliberalism, you know, which we need to distinguish from the, the liberal tradition. So uh, um, this, this is why when we speak of democracy, in fact, we speak of the fact that, you know, liberal institution and everything that has got to do as I was saying, and I want to insist on that because I think that explains many resistances, uh, popular sovereignty and equality have been evacuated. Those changes at the political level, that are called post-politics, have taken place in the context of a new mode of capitalist regulation. So here we enter the domain of the economic, not anymore of the political. 
uh, a new mode of uh, capital regulation where financial capital occupies a central place. With the financialization of the economy, uh, there was a great expansion of the financial sector uh, at the cost of the productive economy. With the effects of austerity policies that were imposed after the 2008 cri crisis, we have in fact witnessed an exponential increase of the inequalities in most European countries, particularly, of course, in the south of Europe. This equality, and that's what is important, no longer affects only the working classes, the popular classes, but also a large part of the middle class. Middle class, which has entered into a process of pauperization and precarization. And this has contributed to the fact that the other pillar of the democratic ideal, the defense of equality, has also been eliminated from the liberal democratic discourse. So you can say that the result of this neoliberal hegemony has been the establishment, both socioeconomically and politically, of a truly oligarchic regime. So we are living today in society which will be really become oligarchic. So that's concerning you know, the diagnostic of what the populist moment as resistances to the situation. One of the central theses of my book is that it is in this post-democratic context of the erosion of the democratic ideals of popular sovereignty and equality, and the oligarchization of European societies, that the populist moment should be apprehended. It is characterized by the emergence of a manifold resistance against a political economic system that is increasingly perceived as being controlled by privileged elites who are deaf to the demands of other groups in society. This is a process that begins, in fact, uh, uh, by series of resistances against the post-democratic consensus coming from right-wing populist parties. Right-wing populist parties have begun to develop much before left populist parties. In many countries, those uh, uh, parties have been able to articulate the demands of the popular sector because those popular sector were ignored by the parties of the center, and particularly, of course, by the social democratic parties, because after all, social democratic parties should be the one that represent the interest of the popular classes. So uh, you not, don't really expect so much the, the right to do that. But uh, I think, and I always insist for me, social democratic parties have got an enormous responsibility in the rise of right-wing populism because those right-wing populism has been able to articulate the demands of those sectors because they were not taken into account by social democratic parties. But things have changed, no? Uh, because no, this anti-establishment discourse uh, also comes from the progressive side. And we've seen a development in, 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 well, in, in France, in, in, in uh, Spain, uh, in, in Greece, of what I call left populist parties, uh, that is, parties who, parties of the left, who are also drawing a frontier between the people and the oligarchy. So it is clearly, I want to insist on that, a break with the post-political situation, huh? because the post-political situation which has been dominant in uh, 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 during neoliberal hegemony was precisely what is the, the, the third way of Blair is the idea that there is no more you know, left and right. And, and we, uh, Tony Blair we used to say, we are no all middle class, so we should have you know, uh, no, no problem, no conflict between us. Well, this definitively, uh, this situation of the consensus of the center, that I think politics has not to do with construction of the frontier, is what is no... Uh, been broken by parties both of the left and parties of the right. Uh, what is at stake today in this populist moment? And I, th I think we can speak of a populist moment because precisely we've got this anti-establishment resistances coming from, from both sides. Uh, what's at stake is 
all the resistances to post-democracy are going to be articulated. And of course, all the people is going to be constructed. Because there are many ways in which these people can be constructed. And all, not all political construction of the political frontier is egalitarian objective. Even when the rejection of the existing system is made in the name of giving back power to the people. So that does not necessarily imply that it's going to go in a progressive direction. Uh, both type of populism that, that they vote in common is that they aim to federate unsatisfied demands, but they do it in very different ways. The difference lies in the composition of the we, the people, and how the adversary, the day, the establishment is defined. Right-wing populism claim that it will bring back popular sovereignty and restore democracy. It's important to realize that it's in the name of democracy that they organize. But of course, this sovereignty is understood as national sovereignty and reserved for those who are deemed to be the true nationals. Right-wing populists do not address the demand for equality. So you see in the struggle against post-democracy, they, they try to bring back popular sovereignty, but not in an egalitarian way. They don't care about uh, equality. Uh, and of course, they construct a people that exclude many categories, usually immigrants, seen as a threat to the identity and the prosperity of the nation. We could say that is some kind of form, form of, of immunization. Right? We are going to protect ourselves from, from, from those groups. This, their, the victory of right-wing populist parties could, of course, lead to nationalistic, authoritarian form of neoliberalism that, in the name of recovering democracy, will, in fact, drastically restrict democracy. Of course, the objective of left populism is totally uh, 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 different. In that case, the objective is to recover democracy, but in order to deepen and extend democracy. As I've, uh, uh, I've, I've uh, said before, the social democratic parties, who in man, many countries have played an important role in the implementation of neoliberal policies and who are responsible for the growth of right-wing populism, they are, of course, unable to understand the nature of the populist moment and to face the challenge that it represents. They cannot recognize that many of the demands articulated by right-wing populist parties are democratic demands to which a progressive answer must be given. So this is also some of uh, this is which very, very controversial for some people that I defend. You know, originally those, those demands, those demands, those resistances are resistances against post-democracy. It's a cry for democracy. Uh, but they can be articulated in many different ways. And, and this is what, where the challenge is. You know, they can be articulated by right-wing populism or by le left uh, populism. Classif this is why I also uh, 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 insist, and it's also very controversial, for that one should not classify right-wing populist parties as extreme right or neo-fascist. And, and you know, dismiss completely the, 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 the people who vote for them and uh, the, 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 their demand. And I think it's a big mistake to attribute their appeal to the lack of education, uh, as it is often the case. Because, of course, it's very convenient for the forces of the center left. Huh? To say, ah, but those, are, those people are, uh, uh, some of them, some people of the left say, oh, those are people are incre intrinsically racist, sexist, homophobic, and they are badly educated. You know. Remember the deplorable of uh, uh, Hillary Clinton. You know. And uh, of course, it's very easy and very convenient for the forces of the center uh, uh, left because it's a way in which they can be disqualified without recognizing the center left own responsibility in such an emergence. Uh, 
So it's a, you know, some kind of phenomenon, you know, return of the brown plague, return, a leper, as Macron will, will say, that comes, when we don't know very, very much from where, we don't know what could be, we just only make, you know, some kind of cordon sanitaire to protect us from, from them. And what, of course, what they do is to establish a moral frontier, so as to exclude the extremists from the democratic debates. And they can feel themselves, we are the good Democrats, you know, uh, because we, 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 we not say, ah, no, no, those people, we, we, they can't really have a voice. And uh, they say, well, what we should try to do is just stop the rise of irrational passion without recognizing that the, the demand that originally are expressed to those parties are demand for democracy, form of democracy. I think that such a strategy of demonization of who are the, those groups who are presented as the enemies or the bipartisan consensus, and of course, presented as putting into question, you know, the, the, we are the Democrats, neoliberalism is democracy, and everybody who criticizes neoliberalism are, you know, potentially fascist. Uh, 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 in it, I think it's obviously uh, morally comforting, let's say, but it's totally politically disempowering. To stop the rise of right-wing populist parties, it is necessary to design a properly political answer through a left populist movement that will federate all the democratic struggle against pro democracy, recognizing the democratic nucleus at the origin of many of those uh, demands. A left populist approach should try to provide a different vocabulary in order to orientate those demands towards egalitarian objective. Of course, it does not mean condoning the politics of right-wing populist parties, but refusing to attribute to their voters the responsibility for the way in which their demands are articulated. I believe that if a different language is made available, many people who vote for right-wing populist parties might experience their situation in a different way and join the progressive struggle. In fact, I mean, I don't have time to develop that, but in the discussion, maybe, I think uh, in, in, in France, people who used to vote for Marine Le Pen have voted for Jean-Luc Mélenchon at the last election, so the people can be won over. A left populist strategy aims at federating the democratic demands into a collective will. This is what, in a sense, by the people, you know, a we, a collective will, confronting a common adversary, the oligarchy. The demand that the left populist strategy seeks to articulate are heterogeneous. And this is why they need to be articulated in what we call in hegemony socialist strategy, a book uh, that Ernesto Laco and I wrote together, a chain of equivalence, whose objective is the creation of a new hegemony that will create the condition for the radicalization of democracy. This process of articulation is crucial because it is by their inscription in a chain of equivalence that singular demand acquire their political signification. So what I'm arguing here is that it's not so much where those demands come from, you know, from the worker, from the, that, that, that counts, but how they are articulated with other demands. Because uh, the example of right-wing populism testify, demand for democracy, coming for instance, from the popular sector, can be articulated in the xenophobic vocabulary. They do not automatically have a progressive character. It is only by entering in equivalence with other democratic demands, for instance, the demand of the immigrant, the feminist, the anti-racist, that they will acquire a radical democratic dimension. We should never take for granted that they are struggles which are inherently emancipatory and cannot be oriented towards opposite ends. I think, for instance, that the current development of form of ecology with clear anti-democratic characteristics should be seen as a warning that the refusal of the neoliberal model is no guarantee of a democratic advance. With ecology, as in other domains, the question of articulation is decisive. And this is why it is so essential to establish a link between the variety of democratic demands 
around the identification with a project of radicalization of democracy. And in this particular case, for instance, I think this is why it's so important to articulate ecological demands with social demands, you know, so, so that create a form of ecology. And I think, for instance, uh, the, the idea of a Green New Deal is very interesting from that point of view, because it's precisely an articulation of social and ecological demands. The strategy of left populism seeks the establishment of a new hegemonic order within and I want to insist on that, the constitutional liberal democratic framework. It does not aim at a radical break with pluralist uh, liberal democracy and the foundation of a totally new political order. So it is on the mode of what we could call an immanent critique of the liberal democratic regime that a left populist strategy intervenes to challenge poor democracy and restore the centrality of the democratic value of equality and popular sovereignty, of course, in order to radicalize them. Such a mode of intervention is possible because despite the relegation by neoliberalism, democratic values still play a significant role in the political imaginary of our societies. And I think that their critical meaning can be reactivated to subvert the hegemonic order and to create a different one. Uh, to inscribe the less left populist strategy in the democratic tradition is, in my view, the decisive move, because this establishes a connection with the political values that are central to popular aspiration. The fact that so many of resistances against various forms of oppression are expressed as democratic demands testify to the crucial role played by the signifier democracy in the political imaginary. Of course, this signifier is often abused, but it has not lost its radical potential. And I'm convinced that when used critically, emphasizing its egalitarian dimension, it constitutes a powerful weapon in the hegemonic struggle to create a new common sense. So what is at stake? in an hegemonic strategy, a strategy that engages with the existing political institution in the transformation of those uh, uh, institutions through democratic pro procedure is something which I call a form of radical reformism. That is something that rejects the false dilemma between reform and revolution. And it is clearly different both from the revolutionary strategy of the, what is called, I don't like the term, but extreme left, the revolutionary left, and from the sterile reformism of the social liberals who only seek a mere alternation in government. And this is why I call it radical reformism, to indicate the subversive dimension of the reform uh, and the fact that what they pursue although it is through democratic means, it's a profound transformation of the structure of socio-economic power relations. In fact, there is a term that André Gors, uh, the, the French sociologist, used, which I think is very opposite. He speaks of non-reformist reform. That's what I understand by radical reformism. So we could say that within the spectrum of what is usually understood by the left, one could distinguish, distinguish three types of politics. The first is pure reformism that, you know, the social democratic uh, parties, the, 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 the parties which have accepted the concession of the center, uh, that accept both the principle of legitimacy of liberal democracy, and I think that that's something that is good, but also the existing neoliberal hegemonic social formation. Second is what I defend, radical reformism that accept the principle of legitimacy of liberal democracy, it's not a, a total uh, break, but attempts to implement within this context a different hegemonic uh, formation. And finally, we've got the revolutionary politics that seeks a total rupture with the existing political order. 
Under this third category, we find not only the traditional Leninist politics, but also other types like those promoted by the anarchists or the advocate of the insurrection, which call for a total rejection of the state and of liberal democratic institutions. And this is why I think it's a total mistake to present, as is often done, left populism as an avatar of extreme left. For instance, you know, it does not make sense to present La France Insoumise of Jean-Luc Mélenchon as extreme left. This is not extreme left. You know, but of course, it's very convenient for the forces of the center to present all the, the, the groups which put into question neoliberalism as being extreme, as anti-democratic and outside you know, the, 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 the kind of spectrum which is acceptable. The objective of a left populist strategy is the creation of a popular majority to come to power, that's very important for a, a, a left populism, and establish a new hegemonic formation. The challenge that it faces is the construction of a people around a project which addresses the diverse form of subordination around issues concerning, for instance, exploitation, domination or discrimination. And this requires reassessing the importance of the social question, taking account of the increasing fragmentation and diversity of the workers, but also the specificity of various other democratic demands. For instance, LGTB, feminism, anti-racism, you know, this is the articulation between the social question and some kind called the societal issue. But of course, here, and I want to insist and, and finish on this, a special emphasis must be given to a question which has gained a particular relevance in the last 30 years and which is of a special urgency today, and it is the future of the planet. It is impossible to envisage a project of radicalization of democracy in which the ecological question is not at the center of the agenda. It is therefore essential to combine the ecological question with the social question. Of course, this is not going to be easy, and the abandonment of the productivist model uh, um, is something that is going to create resistance, but I think that an ambiguous, uh, ambitious sorry, and well-designed ecological project could offer an attractive vision of a future democratic society that might entice some sector which are currently attracted, accepted, and even benefiting from uh, uh, neoliberalism. Uh, a project of radicalization of democracy could also appeal to constituencies which so far have not identified with the left. And thanks to an adequate hegemonic politics, more people than before could be recruited for a political progressive alternative. This is what is called the transversal character of populist uh, strategy. For instance, uh, Podemos, uh, when they were saying that they did not want to be pinpointed as left and right, because we want to address not only the people who consider themselves as being part of the left, but also other people who might have voted for the Parti Popular, the right in Spain, but are also affected by the politics of austerity, by also affected, that, and they can be won over to our project, you know? So we should, it should not simply be directed to the traditional parties of the left. And that, that of course, is something which is crucial to the left populist strategy. I want to emphasize that a left populist strategy, its objective is not the establishment of a populist regime populist regime with a predefined program, but to bring about a new hegemonic formation that will foster the process of recovery, deepening, and radicalization of democracy. This hegemonic formation will take different shape according to specific trajectories involved. You know, in different countries, it takes different shape. Uh, it could be envisaged, for instance, as democratic socialism, eco-socialism, but also things in which the the term socialism does not appear, that are more associative democracy or participatory democracy. Everything depends on the context and national tradition. The chain of equivalence through which the people is going to be constructed will depend on historical circumstances and 
its dynamic cannot be determined in isolation from all contextual reference. So there is no blueprint. You know, ah, this is what, no, this is going to be different to different countries. What is important, whatever the name, is that the recognition of that democracy is the hegemonic signifier around which the diverse struggles are articulated. And the institution of, and that the institution of political liberalism are not discarded. And this is, you know, why my main claim in, in, in the book is that we've got to resist completely and, uh, uh, this accusation by uh, uh, people defending uh, neoliberalism that any kind of critique of this is something which is anti-democratic. In fact, my claim is that today left populism is the way to recover and to uh, uh, give a new life to democracy. So it's not at all something that uh, put in danger democracy. It's, it's, let's say the future of democracy will depend on the possibility of giving a left populist uh, uh, issue to the crisis of neoliberalism. Thank you. Thank you, Chantal Mou, for this uh, fantastic lecture. Um, I want to start with the, uh, the beginning of your lecture, and even with the beginning of your book, where you say you start with the idea that we are witnessing now a populist moment. And so that's my first question. Is that really so? Because there are um, people that say that populism is from all times. We just have a different populism now through social media, uh, but populism has been there 50 years ago and even 100 years ago. Uh, well, yeah, I understand you, could, but, but you know, by saying populist moment, I'm not saying that this is something completely new, uh, that there was no populism before. I'm just saying that uh, um, I never thought that one, it could be interpreted in, in that way. That populist moment, like you know, something completely new. Uh, uh, no, because in fact I've been uh, interested in you know the populist first populist party was in in uh, the uh, uh, end of the 19th century in 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 in, um, in the U.S. called uh, so it's not a t and and then during the last century we had a lot of populist moment in uh, p pardon. Uh, uh, government and, and movement in, in Latin America. So of course it's not something, but what I think is, it's interesting from that point of view, you see, what, what, to, today the situation in Western Europe, and by the way, it, when I insist in, in the book, I, 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 I say Western Europe, so I'm not including, for instance, the, the, what's happening in, in uh, um, Central Europe or activity, because I think that the usually very often uh, example of populism are either Orban or Kaczynski or that. And I think that uh, do, no, I'm not saying that we should not, you know, examine, but, but except the fact that I personally don't think that Orban is a populist. Uh, or, and, and there is a tendency to conflate, you know, different Orban government is authoritarian, nationalist, conservative, but I don't see what is the popular dimension in there at all. Uh, um, and in fact, this is what I was saying. When people want to they put everything that they don't like into public. Also, for instance, well, Orban uh, could definitely also be, this is a form of illiberal democracy. You know, that, that, I think, is a term that is mo mo more uh, uh, adequate to um, refer to that party. But that does not make it populist, you know? Uh, um, populism, and, and I insist, is a strategy of construction of the political frontier that say that the people against the establishment. So in fact, it's, it's, uh, it's not a strategy de 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 uh, developed by people who are in government, usually. Because the it's strategy, but we are in, so let me uh, come back to your question. Um, it's a populist moment. Uh, uh, this is, in fact, new for uh, Western Europe, and it's because precisely we are today in Western Europe 
living through what I call this process of oligarchization of, 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 of society. Where, let's say, for instance, uh, during the, uh, what I call the social democratic uh, hegemony, no? the Canadian welfare state, uh, uh, this was not, not at all a, a situation that was propitious to uh, uh, what I would be called a, 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 a construction of the frontier between the people and the establishment. Uh, because we did not have a situation in which there was uh, an increasing number of uh, people, you know, more and more uh, 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 opposition, because this is what I call a pop, uh, uh, um, pop, sorry, uh, uh, oligarchization, a situation in which you've got a, a small group, even smaller and smaller, very rich people, and another group of people including the middle class, which are becoming poorer. This is a, a, a type of uh, a situation which is new for Western Europe. We did not have that during the, the welfare state, you know? Um, and but so this is why it, what I call populist moment is, is something that needs to be understood in spe specific characteristic. Uh, uh, okay. But I don't think that is uh, new in, ge in, in, uh, in general. It is, it is new for, for uh, Western Europe. And it, it's due uh, precisely to the, the, the consequence in the, of resistances to neoliberalism. Thank you. The, the reason why I ask uh, that question is because I was wondering when did you uh, uh, decide or, or see that left populism is the right answer to that? So. Yeah, well, no, I, 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 that's a very good question. And in fact, I could uh, explain to you because I've been uh, often asked, and, it's, and, and I recognize, that uh, there is a difference between the kind of argument I was making in, uh, in a book published in 2005, uh, called, uh, I refer to it, you know, uh, um, the, 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 on, on the political, on the political, it's, it's a book in, and, and today left populism. And I explain the, the, the difference. In the book uh, on the political, I was basically criticizing the third way. It was the moment of Blair and his book. When I was, because this mo model was pre developed theoretically by Anthony Giddens, by uh, Ulrich Beck in Germany, were uh, claiming, uh, no, the adversarial model of politics has been overcome. Uh, um, there is no more antagonism. Uh, um, Giddens wrote a book, Beyond Left and Right, and there was what he, this is what I call the consensus of the center. And they were saying, this is a great progress of democra for democracy. Democracy has become much more mature, and so no, we should rejoice in that. And I was saying, no, it's a danger for democracy, because in fact, uh, it is creating the terrain for the development of right-wing populism. And I wa ra was saying that in 2005. At that moment, uh, there were two main important uh, uh, right-wing populist parties, the FPÖ with Gork Eider in uh, uh, Austria, which I, uh, 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 on which I did a lot of research, uh, and of course, uh, the, the Front National in France, but it was with the father at that time. But there, was, there were no uh, right-wing populist parties in most of, uh, of other countries in Europe. No, 15 years later, uh, we've got, in fact, uh, and I think that's my point, it's a consequence of uh, uh, th this post-political situation. We've seen emerging right-wing populist parties in, in, in all of, of Europe. So I think, unfortunately, I was right to say this model is not good for democracy. It is undermining democracy. But at that moment, what I was claiming, that the solution was to re-establish the difference between left and right. And let's say, I, I now realize posteriori, I was still hoping that social democratic parties could you know, recover the, the, their uh, 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 left uh, 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 soul, if, if you want to call it like that. I, I was really addressing the idea is don't follow that model. You know, it's, 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 it's dangerous. This is going to. And I've, in the meantime, I've lost my illusion about the possibility of transforming social democratic parties. And you know when that was the crucial moment was the crisis of 2008. Because the crisis of 2008 made me understand that 
to put it maybe a bit too, too radically, social democratic parties were beyond repair. Uh, because they had, would have at, at that moment, the possibility to intervene. You know, remember before that the state was demonized, you know, the state was the enemy. And then of course the crisis and everybody was calling, ah, the state, we need to, the state to help. You know, so there, there was a moment, a, 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 a moment of opportunity. If they had been willing, if they had been prepared, but of course the problem is that they, 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 they were not, they could not. They could have done what Franklin Roosevelt did at, uh, with the uh, moment of the uh, New Deal, you know, to take advantage of the crisis to have, have more democratic, more redistributive policies, to use the state in, uh, in order to do a redistribution. But of course, this is not what happened. They, they, they did intervene, but to save the, bank, save the bank. And then, of course, uh, they accepted the kind of austerity politics proposed by, by the right. And at that moment, I told no. This, the, the, that's really the, the end. There is no possibility. By the way, here I want to insist that there are some exceptions. For instance, Britain with Corbyn, uh, we are seeing the, the, a social democratic Labour Party who is breaking with uh, uh, um, the, the, the third way. I mean, because yeah, I will, I will return to Corbyn yeah. in okay. a moment. Okay. Uh, okay. But, but, but so, so you understand what, what the reason for yeah, yeah. which I is no, no. And this is why. And, and of course, the, 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 the condition of so if, if change, because this process of oligarchization, which uh, I'm referring to, is something which is recent. You know, it's a, so when I wrote uh, in 2005 uh, on the political, the situation was different. And, and I think it's you no, know, the crisis, uh, the reaction of the Social Democratic Party to the crisis, and the fact the oligarchization of, of the, that made me, you know, no, we need this frontier need to be drawn in a different way. We need to really establish uh, uh, um, yeah, a, 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 a confrontation between the people, the people understood, of course, in the multiplicity of democratic demands and the, 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 the oligarchy. So yeah. this is what the difference. Okay, and so you uh, propose uh, that uh, left uh, populism, but populism in general has a very negative connotation for most of the people. And you're, you're of course, uh, uh, a political philosopher, a theorist, and you have a whole explanation what you precisely mean by uh, left populism, but most people will not like the masses will not read your book, um, and they will just hear left populism, oh, that should be, maybe that's something bad. So is it strategic well, to well, like, propose left uh, populism? Of course, you know, th that's a lot of people say that, but, uh, and maybe my, 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 my fight is, is, is doomed, but, uh, <laughs> but I we, need to, no, we need to realize that this negative understanding is, Mainly, it's, it's very typical to Western Europe. In the U.S., you know, the, 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 because they have all that tradition of uh, democratic populism, which of course is also exists uh, uh, right-wing populism, but they don't have that negative view. For most people, Bernie Sanders is a left populism. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is a left populism. Populist and, and they and, and it's not seen negatively, you know. So I think that uh, the the way in which populism is understood in the state is not at all the same. And for that matter, in Latin America, is different. So I think I agree with you. The situation is difficult in 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 uh, uh, Western Europe, and it's, but it's basically for me linked to the fact that um, the way in in. in it's a kind of desperate attempt by the, the forces of, of the center, uh, uh, the, the, well, the defense of neoliberalism, you know, to, to try to discredit, to stigmatize all the people who are uh, um, against the, the, the ne ne neoliberalism. And, um, and I am trying to uh, fight against that and say, well, there is no reason why, uh, even in, in in France, for instance, I was told recently that uh, tw 20 years ago, there was a, a prix du roman populisme. I mean, populism was not seen in, in a negative way. 
You know, we, we should not uh, 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 generalize starting it at the moment, of course, it's, it's a term of uh, stigmatization, of insult, of uh, dismissal. But uh, I, I think that's, that's, big, that's changing. That's changing. For instance, the fact that uh, the Corbyn uh, Labour Party recognize that the, they, the, their politics is, is they defend a left populist strategy. Uh, 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 La France Insoumise, uh, so I think, but yeah, it, it's a, a, it's a struggle, uh, uh, but I, I, I believe that it's, it's, uh, uh, it's worth doing, and may, mainly if, if, if I've got a, m a moment to explain why, I think that by using, uh, after all, po 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 populism, what does it mean, populism? For me, populism is a d dimension of democracy. Democracy is demos kratos, the power of the demos, the, pe the people. Well, the people is the demos, so I think for me, it's a dimension of, of democracy, populism. So the, I, I don't see why it should be, we should restore the, the, the importance of, of the voice of the people. And after all, you know, 2,000 uh, uh, years ago, democracy was also a time of stigmatization, you know, and, and it was uh, re recovered and recuperated. So I don't see why uh, it should, that should not be the, the, uh, the case again today. In, in your book, you, you uh, explain how left and right wing populism share a narrative and the narrative that they fight for the voices of the people against the establishment. And um, that's the question. Uh, do they really change the establishment and do they really give a voice? And you mentioned uh, um, Jeremy Corbyn um, already. And I think when we look on what he did, it's not that it's an undisputed success for everybody. I think a lot of his voters and a lot of people now on the left don't feel represented by him and don't feel that their needs are represented. Um, just to mention with his stand and with his view on the Brexit. So uh, does he as a left populist uh, give really a voice? Well, uh, there, are, there are several things. Uh, uh, um that I will I want to uh, answer that first. I didn't say that the, the left populism share a narrative. I never say that. Uh, that, that uh, what I say is that they've got something in common, but this, I didn't speak of a, a same narrative because I don't think it's the same narrative at all. But they've got something in common is that they are trying to uh, articulate resistance popular resistances to neoliberal globalization, you know, those do, do demands. And they are, but they are trying to articulate them in completely different ways, you know, so, so it's, not a, it's not a narrative. Uh, no, I think that it, one must be very precise ab about words. Coming to Jeremy Corbyn, well, you know, you, you uh, d depend, of course, half, half of the, uh, uh, well, more than half, unfortunately, three quarter of the uh, Labour Parliamentary Party is against Corbyn because they are Blairites. You know, they, they, they remain. Uh, uh, and but on the other side, uh, and the, the fight of Corbyn is, is a very uh, uh, difficult fight because on one part he's got. Remember, I mean, the, the fantastic. Uh, uh, well, first he was twice elected. Uh, leader of the Labour Party was first elected and then they tried to uh, uh, throw him away. To, he was uh, re-elected with more voices. Corbyn has got among the young people and I say it's a very uh, important uh, following. Uh, but of course he's got, you know, the, the, the still the, the, the majority, fortunately, of the Labour Parliamentary Party with still a Blairite. Concerning to his position on Brexit, precisely, I think this is exactly the, 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 the strategy of uh, left populism that he is, is uh, um, following. And it is the difficult situation because Corbyn is in a situation in which 60% uh, of the elector electorate are remainers. Uh, particularly, you know, the people of momentum and, and, and people in the big cities. But they are 40% of the, the labor voters, people, the uh, uh, popular working class from the north, which are Brexiters. They want to, 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 to leave. Uh, and also, 
the main trade unions who support Corbyn, Unite, and like Max, they are also aware. So Corbyn is trying to establish a chain of equivalence between the, 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 the momentum, let's say, and, and the, 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 the Brexiters. He does not, he, uh, because to establish a, a chain of equivalence means precisely to try to find a ways in which we are going to try to represent both. And this is, this is the difficulty because uh, it could perfectly, of course, have decided, okay, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, 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 I'm going to go with, with, uh, with momentum and I'm going to go reminders, but it meant abandoning the working class from the north. And of course, that will not have been a left populist strategy. But, but left populist strategy means to try to find a way to not, you know, privilege one sector of the... That, that is, uh, is an extremely complicated situation for Corbyn. And, and uh, uh, I, this is why he ap ap appears as being so uh, uh, indecisive and he, does, he doesn't want you know, to privilege one claim over the other. He's trying to find ways in which he can combine them. But so I don't think that is, is against left populism. In fact, it shows exactly what is a left populist strategy. Articulate okay. different uh, uh, demands. And, and it also shows the difficulty, of course. You know? okay. um, you say in your lecture, and it's also in the book and in interviews, uh, you repeat that right-wing populist parties shouldn't be called, classified as extreme right or as fascists um, or as people that have a moral disease. Um, and you say, yeah, that's convenient maybe in the political theater that the central uh, left is doing that. And so my first question is, is only the central left doing that? Because I have the feeling that a lot of people are just on the left left are doing that, whatever you want to call that left. And, uh, and additional to that question, uh, would you not uh, be able to say to a party that it's a fascist party, or do you think there are no fascist parties anymore? Of course there are fascist parties. For instance, I think that Bolsonaro in, 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 in uh, uh, Brazil, this is uh, fascist. And you fascist. can call them fascist? Yes, yes. Uh, 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 and I think, for instance, it's in fact, to, to present Bolsonaro as a, uh, a Trump tropical, it's, it's, it's much worse than Trump. It's much worse than Trump. This, this is clearly a fascist. Uh, fascist. But, you know, uh, um, the f uh, first, of course, I agree totally with you, it's not only the center. Um, unfortunately, I mean, most of the left, and particularly the, 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 the uh, radical left, are the ones who, who uh, uh, be believe that the, the way to combat, for instance, uh, um, I'm thinking here, particularly the case of France. You know, Marine Le Pen is to say, ah, she's extreme left, she's a fascist, and uh, but but no. And for, for me, it's the tragedy of the left precisely is, is the fact that the left is so totally moralistic and and uh, uh, rationalistic. They don't uh, un, un, un understand the the. Um, I, I could go. I, I'm, I'm very passionate about that topic. I could go, yeah, go for on. one for one hour about that, but I'm going to try to be precise. Uh, uh, Look, first, I think that if we are taking seriously the question of, uh, historically, uh, la, 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 la extreme left, uh, extreme right, sorry. Extreme right always has referred, still no, to anti-parliamentary uh, uh, movement. Uh, uh, um, movement which do refuse, for instance, in, in, in France, extreme right is always, is always been refer to parties who did not accept the republic. You know, they, they, they want to put, so this is extreme right, the, the, it, it's, its meaning. And of course, fascism is also something which is a specific meaning. I don't think that we can say that Marine Le Pen is fascist or extreme right. And by the way, I, I don't really know much about uh, uh, um, politics in, um, Holland, but I don't think one can call, uh, 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 strictly speaking, uh, Gert Wilders a fascist, you know? Uh, uh, and I think there is, it's, it's, it's very convenient, you know? It's, uh, the, the, it, it's, it's convenient in a sense, because, but it's also very, uh, 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 it's a lack of rigor, it's a lack of trying to understand, ah, oh, no, that those people are, uh, and I think the danger, and, and uh, with that, once you've, 
classify them as fascist or extreme right, then you don't really have to wonder why people vote for them, why, what is their attraction, do they, in a sense, and, and of course this is my, 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 my main uh, thesis in the book, that the fact that the demand, no, not all of them of course, uh, because obviously there are some people who, who, who uh, psychological makeup is definitely anti-democratic, but um, the fact, and, I, and I'm coming again to the, to the, the case of uh, Marine Le Pen in, um, in France, many uh, uh, working class area who used to vote for, for the communists if uh, uh, moved to vote for uh, um, Marine Le Pen. I mean, I don't know if you've read uh, uh, here the book by Didier Eribon, Retour à Reims. It's a fantastic book where uh, he explained that, among um, other things, that, you know, uh, when, when he, he came from a very, very, very poor uh, 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 family in Reims, uh, his uh, parents were communists. He, being a, a gay, uh, broke with his family, went to Paris, came back 30 years later and found out that his family and all the, the, their friends were voting Marine Le Pen, you know, and, and tried to understand wh what happened. Why is it that... Uh, so you can't... You need to really uh, ask the question, what has happened? And, and I think that a great part, and that's also the, 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 what, what Didier Eribon say, those people have felt abandoned by the social democrats. You know, the, the social democrats at the moment when they believed that there was no alternative to neoliberal globalization, so of course they, they could, they, they did not have any discourse with respect to the loser of this neoliberal globalization. And they you know, left them. In fact, there was even uh, a think tank, uh, 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 Terra Nova of the social, uh, Socialist Party, who in fact did, did say we should not bo bo bother anymore about those people. They are not going to vote for us an anymore. Le leave them to Marine Le Pen. You know, let's concentrate on the middle class and on the immigrants. You know, so of course the, she she was offered those things, and I think this is something that we've got to fight. You know, we should try to understand and, and not say, ah, those pe people are uh, uh, intrinsically fascist. Uh, no, we should try to understand what went wrong in the left in order to see how we can recover. So, so I think that is very dangerous. To, f first, it's historically inaccurate. You know? uh, and second, I think that is very dangerous because it does not, uh, uh, it's not going to help to uh, uh, have another discourse for those people. Yeah. Okay, um, that's very clear. Um, you touch in your lecture and also in your book on uh, climate movements, and uh, that's something that is very vivid now, from uh, the bottom up, that there are a lot of young people on the streets now in Belgium and also in the Netherlands. Um, and you suggest in your book that ecology uh, will play a big role in a populist left strategy. Um, and so I was wondering, why, why do you think it's the climate and the uh, will play that crucial role? Uh, is it because it's a major, major challenge for, for the future that we are facing? And will the Green parties be then the future of the left? Or will socialist and social democratic parties be the future of the left, or both? Well, you know, that depends very much on the countries. I don't think that they are an, 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 uh, uh, um, for First, I, I'm, I'm not saying that they, they will. I say that they should, which is dif different. <laughs> Uh, because I, I don't think that uh, uh, um, if one understands by a left populist strategy uh, uh, the articulation of sayers of democratic demands, it's obvious that the ecological demand is, is an, an, a, 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 a crucial, crucial question. So, uh, uh, and of course, and by the way, I think it's fa fantastic what's happening, uh, well, in, in, in Belgium, in Holland, but also no, and, and obviously it began, all began in, in, in Sweden, yeah. but no, it's beginning, you know, to, to the, the mo 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 mobilization of the young people is something, if there is something to be, you know, happy and proud about today is, is, is that. And is it populistic? Well, uh, uh, not yet, or not, not it, you know, at the moment, uh, it, it creates a terrain that, in fact, could, should be articulated uh, uh, in uh, um, 
a, a way which is um, in, 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 in articulation with, with uh, uh, um, social democracy. This is why I, I, in, in my uh, presentation I was saying that I think that the, uh, what Ocasio, uh, Alexander Ocasio-Cortez, and, and in fact Bernie Sanders is also in favor of that, this idea of the Green New Deal I think is a great idea because it's a way in which you are articulating the, the fight for the environment with social question because this uh, ecology is not necessarily progressive. You know, in fact, they are some very authoritarian form of, of uh, ecology. We say ecology is such a question that only a dictatorship can deal with that. We should certainly not, you know, uh, leave that to, 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 to democracy. They are also, uh, um, in fact, particularly in France at the moment, uh, some very conservative and I would say even reactionary way to try to articulate ecological question. Uh, for instance, uh, if you articulate uh, ecology with immigration, we have some people that think, ah, oh, you know, immigrants, that it's, you know, they, it's, they bring pollution, they bring things. Uh, uh, or, uh, so, they, 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 in fact, there, there is a, a, a journal in France which is um, called Limit, uh, which is organized by a series of people who were very active in the, the demonstration against the, the marriage pour tous, you know, so, so the, the possibility for homosexuals to get married. There was, I don't know if you remember, but there was a very, very big uh, mobilization against uh, Christine Taubira's law. Well, those people remain there and now they are organizing uh, against ecological question, defending, for articulating, for instance, ecology with traditional families, with uh, 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 the, the traditional view for women. Well, well, one point I insist very much in, in my presentation, of course, this comes from uh, another, another part of, of my work, uh, which I did not speak about here, but which is the anti-essentialism. You know, the idea that uh, the, the Everything is, a dis is the result of a discursive construction. So there is no uh, ecology that will be always uh, progressive. No, it all depends on how you articulate it. Ecology could be articulated in a very uh, uh, right-wing way. It can also be articulated in, in a defense of re uh, recuperation of capitalism. Of course, there is the, 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 the green capitalism. So it all depends. I think it's a terrain of struggle ecology. It's the, the way in which it's going to go, if it's going to go something that helps us to radicalize democracy or, or the contrary, to make it more restrictive. You know? So this is why I think it's definitely very important uh, that it's a crucial issue in a left-wing populist struggle because it's the way in which you are going to articulate the ecological demand in, with other social demands with other, in a way which is going to develop a project you know, in which uh, there is synergy between the defense of the planet and, and other, you know, anti-pro-feminist, anti, uh, 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 pro uh, so, but uh, uh, I, I think for me it's definitely something that should be, I could not imagine uh, a left populist strategy that will not really deal with the question of ecology, just too important, you yeah. know, too important. Uh, in May, we will have European elections, and if we look to the polls, then it looks like predominantly right-wing populists will win. Will win. Um, is it too late now to do something and um, make it happen for the left uh, populists? Um, and do you think that left-wing populism is strong enough to really counter right-wing populists that are now in power and, as such, save democracy? And let's say that uh, the polls are right and that uh, all right-wing populists will be uh, elected. Will that then mean the end of democracy? <laughs> I like small I questions. I don't think I can answer that question, but uh, let's say, uh, uh, I can try. Um, I mean, I, I think definitively, I don't think that will be the, the... 
Maybe step well, by step yeah, I will no, first. No, okay, oh, yeah? I, I, there are two questions. I, I'm, I'm going to try to address the question from two points yeah. of view. Uh, t t starting from the last one. I will definitely, I mean, end of democracy, I, don't, I wouldn't put it like that, but I will say development of illiberal form of democracy because okay. I think that yeah. uh, 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 democracy is not by itself. That's also another, I mean, I've got a book uh, called The Democratic Paradox where I've examined really that question. You know, I think that uh, um, democracy uh, is, is our liberal democracy is an articulation of, I was thinking of two traditions, but you can perfectly if uh, the, the, there's no, here I disagree with Etienne Balibar, for instance, with the idea of uh, 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 um, egal liberté, you know, like, uh, or, or uh, uh, Abermas for that matter, when he believed that uh, there is a, a co-originality between liberty and equality. In, my, in the democratic paradox, I argue that there is a tension, an agonistic tension, because you cannot have this perfect uh, equality and perfect liberty at the same time. There is always one that will, you know, be a, a, a lexically superior. But but I think that is is I, I see that as, as positive this this tension because it creates the possibility for uh, a, a, a pluralism. But so uh, but one should also acknowledge that they are a form of democracy which do, do not have the articulation with liberalism. And you cannot just say uh, they are not democratic. Well, they are not democratic according to our criteria of what is liberal democracy, of what is democracy, which is liberal democracy. But it, you know, it does not mean that they are. Uh, it, it's illegitimate form of democracy. So it's not, that's a question. Uh, on, on the question of the European election, well, I, I don't think that. Uh, uh, well, left, left, it, let's be absolutely honest about that. Uh, left populist existing, left populist movement are not particularly pro-European, that's for sure. Uh, 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 some are more than others, for instance, uh, uh, Podemos is uh, uh, less critical than uh, more than Jean-Luc Mélenchon, La France Insoumise, uh, uh, but generally, left populism are, of course, very critical of actually existing liberal uh, uh, European Union because it is obviously a, ne uh, a neoliberal uh, model. And we've seen what has happened in Greece with Tsipras and with um, you know, Syriza when they came to power and when they wanted to develop their anti-austerity politics and the European Union, no, no, no. You know, and, and so, I oh, know, your election cannot uh, uh, change. Uh, those are the European treaties, and you know, you cannot, uh, 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 an election cannot. Uh, so, obviously, the, the existing uh, uh, neoliberal, uh, neoliberal Europe is, of course, uh, something that uh, needs to be challenged. But the whole question is, uh, and there, there is a debate uh, about that among uh, left populists. Uh, some uh, people, we all agree that you know the actual treaties will not allow the possibility of challenging neoliberalism because, of course, they are uh, in great part you know responsible for th this. But some people will argue that uh, uh, so the only way is to leave the European Union and uh, and so develop some kind of what is called sovereignty. I don't agree with that. Uh, 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 I agree more with the tendency to say we need to find a way for a democratic refoundation of Europe. You know, so, so let's try to uh, 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 transform Europe from the inside. That's the strategy which I uh, uh, will, you know, uh, advocate. But of course, we must also realize that in all, some people say that's impossible. You know, the, the neoliberal. The, and I disagree with that. I don't think that the European project is inherently neoliberal. It has be, become neoliberal because, of course, most of the countries in Europe were ne neoliberal. So the, the European Union is, in a sense, you know, the, the, the mirror of the countries. But, um, and I think that it could be changed on condition of having a establishment of a synergy 
between different left populist movements in Europe so that to change the relation of forces. At the moment, the relation of forces are definitively in favor of, of uh, defense of neoliberalism. But if we were going to have left populist uh, uh, government, you know, or left populist movement be coming to power, then of course it, it, the, the whole thing could, could be changed because the relation of forces, let's imagine, for instance, of course, I'm dreaming a little bit here, but you know, we have left populism in power in France, in, uh, uh, um, in Italy, in, 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 in Spain, and wh why not in uh, Holland and in Belgium. <laughs> then, of course, the, 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 the condition will be cr cr created for a transformation of relation of power. You know, I think tra treaties can be changed. But so the question for me is, or we are going to fight at national level for the development of those uh, left populist movements and, of course, establish a synergy among them. If this is possible, then, of course, I think that we can really transform the European Union. And, and I, I think that uh, uh, this is not an easy thing, but it's the only alternative with which I will defend, because on the other side, we can't do without a, a Europe, you know? It's obvious that we cannot, we can imagine a society in which no suddenly, you know, all those countries, uh, we abandon the Euro, everybody go, goes back to their uh, uh, national uh, money, and, and the, uh, particularly at the present conjuncture at an international level, you know, in which we've got uh, Trump, we've got, after all, with all its limitation, Europe is still a little, you know, well, European Union, because of course we should not, uh, uh, European Union is not Europe, but a uh, um, little island of sanity in, 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 in this world, you know. So I, I think that we should really uh, fight for a refund, what I call a democratic refoundation of Europe. But this, I, 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 I acknowledge, is not a, a position which is dominant and accepted by all yeah. uh, left populist parties. There are left populist parties who are, there is a discussion about yeah. that. I have a last uh, small question this time, and then I will open the floor. Um, you explicitly state in your book that you want that your book is seen as a political act and not as an academic analysis, though it's still, it's, it's still a theoretical analysis. But it's so important to you that, it's a, that we see it as a political act, and I'm intrigued by that. Why? Oh, because uh, I do feel a sense of urgency. I really feel such an urgency. Because I, uh, and, that, and that probably is also linked to the fact that uh, um, I lived in Britain through the Thatcher revolution, you know, the, tra the transition from uh, social democratic hegemony to neoliberalism. And I, I saw, uh, and in fact, this is in, in hegemony socialist strategy, this is what we were examining. Uh, why was it possible? You know, why uh, was this neoliberal revolution possible? And I think that in great part is what because of the mistake of the Labour Party who uh, did not understand the, the importance of hegemonic struggle. And, and, and I, I, I feel that 30 years later, we are now in, in a situation which is in a sense similar because a possibility is open. The crisis of, of, of neoliberalism, which I think is definite and which is of which the populist movement is the expression, opened the things are, we, we are at the moment, you know, crucial. Things are, when I was speaking uh, in terms of what Gramsci called the interregnum, we are at the moment when we really could go into two directions, either towards authoritarian form of neoliberalism and, or radicalization of democracy. And that it is really important for the left to understand that the chance, the danger, and the opportunity and the need to act. But, and also here I want to, to make a, a, a reference. This uh, uh, situation in a sense, I don't know, I mean, I'm sure that here uh, there are people who must know the book by Karl Polanyi, The Great Transformation. And I think that it's very interesting to uh, uh, um, put our situation today in relation to the situation that Polanyi examined in his book. You know? It's a book which is uh, uh, published in the 40s, 
examine precisely the way in which the, the resistances towards what he called the first, well, he didn't say the first, because in fact, it was the moment, but what we can see now is the first moment of a first move towards uh, uh, um, the first globalization, and of course, the result of the, the way in which there was series of resistance against that and against the, the problem that, and the gravity that it caused. And Polanyi showed how, oh, in fact, this need for protection, which was expressed to, through the, 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 the different movement, led to two different, he said, that can lead either to progressive or regressive regime. And he showed how, oh, uh, um, in many cases, for instance, in the case of uh, uh, Nazism, fascism, it, that was the way in which they were oriented towards a, 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 a really restriction of democracy. But he also say it was also the possibility for New Deal and, and um, Roosevelt. And I think that we are in a situation which is similar, you know, in which we are, uh, things are going to go either uh, uh, in the sense of uh, right-wing populism, if, if they uh, um, manage you know, to articulate those, those demands in, in, in a project. It's not going to be fascism, it's going to be different because the situations are, are not the same, but it will be a more restricted, it will be a restriction of democracy, or there is also the possibility for an advance of democracy. And um, so this is why it, it's, it's a political intervention. Of course, it's based on all the, the theoretical work that I've been uh, doing before, which of course, you know, uh, uh, it is central in order to understand the possibility of articulating things differently. Because if you believe that some demands are in intrinsically, you know, right-wing, then of course you, you don't have this possibility to articulate. But I think that, and this is why I think that this, um, theoretical perspective that uh, uh, we develop in hegemony, that put into question essentially, is central to understand really the role of politics, the, the possibility of articulating you know, demands in, in different ways. And so I want to, make, to, to use this theoretical reflection in order to uh, help us to understand the present conjuncture and to envisage you know, how one could act in this conjuncture. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And now we open the floor, so if you have a question. Yeah. We're a bit later, so I think we have only time for a couple of questions, but who has a question? I see there are one in the back. Yeah. I come to you. Thank you. It's very interesting. Thank you very much. Um, it was really inspiring and interesting. Uh, I would like to ask uh, that... Excuse me, can you still... still because I have difficulties understanding, and I want to see you. Who, is, who are you? <laughs> uh, oh really my God! Yes, at the very back. Okay. So um, now is it better? So um, as you were talking about, uh, let's say, in political intervention or political campaign, I would like to ask, um, what sort of emotions would you consider crucial in building this um, collective self-efficacy or this chain of equivalence? Uh, so which sort of emotions like fear, anger, as we saw on the right populist side, are really uh, important? What, in, from your left populist um, construction of people, what sort of emotions would be important? And would you consider ideology as an important, um, as an important thing in this process? So maybe different emotions mobilize left-wing people, different emotions mobilize right-wing people, and maybe the same emotions that mobilize left-wing people can make right-wing people even more radical right or more populist right. Um, yeah, two, two points. First, uh, we don't use the term ideology. Uh, we use the term, um, in, in, and I, I don't use that in my work, and we, we don't use that in hegemony, uh, because ideology Usually, uh, of course, it, it can be understood differently, but usually ideology, in a sense, 
make sense at opposition to science, you know, to say that, okay, we are in the ideology, we are in, in science. And we don't uh, uh, like that kind of, of opposition in the field of, of politics uh, because, um, oh, it's, it's, it will be long to explain that, but uh, for instance, uh, it, it's basically, our reflection is, is about, uh, against this, what we call class essentialist uh, uh, ID that uh, we find in, 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 in much of uh, m traditional Marxism, which is the idea that they are real interests. You know? We are against the idea of real interest, understanding by that interest that belongs to the people necessarily by position. We are not saying that there are no interests of company. Interests are always a political construction. Uh, so, and, and in, uh, usually the people who use ideology use, uh, people are in the ideology because they are not aware of their real interest. So we, we want to avoid th this. And this is why we use the term discourse. A discourse, of course, could be, and it's a discourse, but discourse, but it, uh, using the term discourse, it does not have the same normative connotation. Uh, as ideology, because you know, ideology has got some kind of uh, uh, um, negative con connotation. You know, the, the, you are in, not in the truth, you are in the wrong. You know, and, and I think that that is not helpful. This is why we don't use uh, ideology. But uh, the question of emotion, of, well, I didn't speak ab ab about that, but it's a very important part of my work. And I think, by the way, that's also one of the critiques when I was referring uh, uh, earlier to the fact that I think that the left is much too rationalistic, they believe that in politics, the left should only use arguments, you know, that any attempt to uh, mobilize what I call passion or affects is something, you know, that is fascistic, that is, uh, and of course, that's one of the reasons why they leave the terrain open to, uh, uh, to the right, you know, because the, the right uh, uh, and right-wing populism are very good about mobilizing affects. But I think that the, the left should also mobilize affects because I think that affects are, are really important. And in fact, I, I argue, and, and for doing that, I draw on Spinoza and on Freud to show that, you know, uh, it, well, affects is, is an important mobilizing force. Affects can be mobilized in different ways. You know, they are malleable. So uh, this is why they can be uh, oriented towards um, social justice, towards mod or against the, the immigrants. So I don't think that they are, and by the way, I don't think, the, the, I don't like the idea of, uh, I think you should go to, oh yeah, emotion, which are good. Uh, for instance, uh, rage, indignation, you know, this is something which can be v mobilized in, in a very uh, positive way according to uh, what is the, the target. So here I will not, uh, um, and in fact, uh, that, that's a, 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 a point I, in which I, I disagree with, with, with Spinoza, the idea that they are, ne, ne, uh, pa, le, pa, uh, he speak of uh, passion triste, passion, uh, 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 what, what, traurig, or do you say that, you say that in, in uh, uh, sad, uh, sad passion, you know, I think that, no, it's, uh, uh, and, and that some, some people are moved by a certain type of, of affects and some people are moved by, like if there was some kind of, uh, you know, essentialist uh, things. I don't think that uh, 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 is something essential. This is the way in which those affects are going to be mobilized. And I think that, you know, rage uh, and, and indignation and, and, and uh, can be mobilized in positive terms uh, or in negative terms. If you mobilize that against immigrants or against, you know, that of course is going to produce negative effect. But if you mobilize that uh, against, you know, the capitalist system, you are going to produce. So I, I think that, uh, and. I suppose that's the way in which I will answer your question. For me, this mobilization of affects is a very important element in politics, but we also need to recognize that it's all a question of discursive articulation, that there are no things which are inherently, you know, uh, uh, 
positive or negative or uh, equalitarian or not. It, it's all the way in which they are articulated. Is there another question? Yeah, uh, well, a lot of questions. Many go, questions. Yeah, <laughs> yeah um, I wonder, can you tell me a little bit more about the role of social justice in a left populism? Um, because you know, the, I agree with you that the left should be less moralistic, but then what can a left populism do to protect the rights of immigrants, of refugees, of people of color, of women? Well, I'm sorry, but this is not, uh, my work is not, I'm, I'm not saying that is not an important question, of course, but it's not the kind of things on which I'm, uh, I'm reflecting. There are a lot of people who uh, work on social justice and, and all the things, but I don't think that I'm supposed to answer uh, all the questions and to, uh, I, in my work, I have uh, always, you know, established particular, uh, interest in certain issue in the role of passion in the world, but uh, and, and the, the only thing I can do with respect to, to, to that question is that of course you know social justice is one of the uh, central question or, or values uh, that, that, that the left is, is going to should develop but all that is going to be uh, uh, implemented, that is going to be, by the way, very different according, I'm, I'm not uh, uh, um, in favor of normative political theory. I mean, because I realize this is exactly the terrain where you want to bring me. I am not interested in normative political theory. Uh, uh, I'm not interested in reflecting on, on how the world should be. You know, because, and, and uh, this is a discussion I've got many, uh, very often with uh, other colleagues. They made big, wonderful theories about how the work should be. And then you ask them, oh, yeah, that's very nice, but how are we going to get there? And then they say, oh, well, that's not my problem. Uh, I'm a political philosopher. Uh, those are problems for the politician, you know. Well, um, I, don't, I don't like that because I think one can make wonderful theories about, you know, theories of justice and Ron, John Rawls and, 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 and all that. But then, of course, uh, uh, the whole question is how you are going to, um, let's say, not, not that I don't want to be uh, misunderstood here. Not that I, I think they are useless because they, they can... Uh, um, and in fact, from that point of view, I, I agree very much with what Gramsci was saying. He said, there is a level of reflection which is important, but basically what is important is that all this come, you know, is applied, all, all this come to, to um, be implemented in, 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 in action. Uh, um, so I am more... Uh, uh, um, I, in fact, in, in the, uh, um, the book at the beginning, I, I, I say that m my model uh, in political theory is really uh, Machiavel. Uh, and uh, Althusser is a very nice um, common analysis of, of, of Machiavel in his book called Machiavel and, and Us, in which he said the specificity of Machiavel was Machiavel was always reflecting in the conjuncture. He was not reflecting over the conjuncture. So he's, he's not there saying that all, all the world should be. He was always in, trying to understand a specific conjuncture in order to imagine, you know, how we should act in that conjuncture. Well, that's what I'm interested in. You know, not, not in, in making big, big theories about how the world should be and what social justice should be, but in, our, in, in trying to understand, and this is what I do, in fact, in this book, what is the conjuncture that we are living in? What I call the populist moment? And how, how, you know, what kind of political strategy should we have? And then, of course, the, this uh, all other question will come, obviously, when it, it's a, a question of Im imagining the kind of institution that we need. But I leave that to uh, other people who are more interested in, in, in that. So this is not kind of... Um, theories which I've, I've been in, 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 I don't think that I'm trying to, to think of what I've read. No, I've not, never been really interested in developing the, my reflection at that level, of the normative level. It's 
quite late, so we have one last question, uh, and then we can go to the bar and discuss further. <laughs> so it's here for this woman there. Thank you. Um, maybe f a bit following up on the other question. Um, so uh, one thing that right-wing populists do very well is um, cast all these different struggling parties as adversaries of each uh, other. Uh, uh, what? Uh, no. uh, that something that right-wing populists do very well is yes. um, cast different uh, uh, um, demands as adversarial to each other, um, as in conflict with each other. No, you understand? I don't understand. As one against the other. In For conflict instance, with each other. Conflict with each different other. minorities in ah, conflict okay. with each other, yeah. which you also do in, of course, in the agonist model. Um, so my question is then, um, how can we federate all these conflicting demands? Um, and, and what do we do with the conflict? Is the conflict then aimed against the establishment? And if so, then could you elaborate on what then the establishment is? Is it the, the owning class? <laughs> is it the institutions? Um, uh, and if so, the institutions of, of, of neoliberalism? What, what, which is the, what is the enemy? What is the adversary? That is basically my question. But I mean, I'm not quite sure. Uh, uh, on one side, I think I have uh, uh, answered that, and on the other side, I think that it's a question to which one should not, cannot give one general answer, because it all depends, and I insisted very much on that, there's no blueprint. It's, it's, uh, um, it's going to be very different according to the different societies. For instance, I, I am basically... Uh, uh, involved with a uh, situation in the U UK, in France, and in, in, and in Spain. And I see that, you know, and with three different left populist movements. And I see that the, the difference are very important according to precisely the, 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 the different uh, histories, trajectories of, of those countries. The situation in France very different from because of the French Revolution, because of a political culture, in the one in Britain and, and the one the one in uh, in Spain. So you you, you cannot uh, uh, those are not questions to which one should give a, a theoretical answer. I don't think that political questions are question to be resolved theoretically. Political question has always got to be resolved concretely according to the different uh, context. For instance, the chain of equivalence uh, uh, is different in constructed in France, in, in Spain, and, 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 and in Britain, according to the different forces. Of course, we can give guidelines, you know. Uh, the, for instance, and, and I say uh, it's important to the axiom. Left populism should articulate all democratic uh, de demands, and obviously the demands of the working class, uh, feminist, uh, anti racist But the way it's going to take place is very different. For instance, uh, uh, just take feminism. Uh, you have in Spain, uh, I suppose that if you read newspaper or the, you know that there is an incredible feminist movement in Spain that on the 8th of, uh, of, of March, you know, the, 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 there was strike of women. This is not, nothing really similar in, uh, in, in France and, and not similar in, in uh, Britain either. Of course, you know, there is, it's important to articulate the, the question of feminist movement in all three class, cases, but it's going to be done differently according to the different conjuncture. Uh, politics is always to deal with conjuncture, and, and so you can't say, oh, how are you going to articulate? There is no answer to those questions. You know, it's, it's something that needs to be, for instance, uh, uh, as I was saying here in, react, in, in uh, answer to the question about Brexit in, uh, um, in Britain, uh, well, the question is, that, yeah, difficulty is to articulate the months of momentum and the months of, of, of the, the trade unions, you know. Uh, 
well, I'm, I'm not going to tell the, ah, this, oh, you should articulate. No, the, the tra, uh, Corbin is trying to see if there is a way in which uh, the politics, for instance, I mean, uh, what he's trying to do, uh, uh, I should try to pop, maybe to give a little bit more um, and, and by, by the way, does somebody know? Uh, was it uh, was the, the, was she defeated, um, uh, Theresa May? Yes, yeah. yes. Oh my goodness! So that <laughs> you know, it's it's this Brexit thing is a total nightmare. Total yeah. nightmare. We don't really know what's going to happen. It, everything is possible, but the strategy of Corbyn, because it it gives you an, a strategy of Corbyn. So he, he needs to articulate the demands of the, of the uh, of the uh, um, workers. You know, the, the north from the demands of middle class. You know, people momentum. Uh, um, so so far, but of course, no. It, uh, <laughs> crucial moment has come. He was defending what they call constructive ambiguity. You know, not not taking too much. Time. But of course, I think they were at, at Labour very uh, uh, aware of the fact that uh, uh, I well, ideally what they wanted, and I think that would have been the best solution to have a, a, a general election. But if that was not going to happen, they were in fact in favour of having a, a second referendum. But they could not call for a second referendum because, of course, that would have alienated the, the, the people you know, from, the, from the north. So the question was, and still we are in the, uh, to try to, how can I explain that? Uh, 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 arrive at the moment, and I think that's what's going to happen now, when they are going to defend, of course, a second referendum, but saying to the people from the, the, the workers from the north, this is not our choice, you know, this is not what we wanted, but it's something we are forced to that. This is the, 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 the chaos and the, it's taken us to that. We are forced because that's the only solution, you know. So in fact, they could defend the second referendum uh, uh, without alienating, that's, that's what they hope, alienating the people from the, from the north. Uh, so you see, it's, it's, th those questions are always resolved through a series of practical uh, move and trying to see. You could not have say, oh, you know, the way to articulate the demand is to do, do that. No, you, you need always to act in specific con conjuncture, and I think that that is true for many other things. There is no theoretical answer to those questions of how you are going to articulate the demand. You know, you n know that if you want to create a collective will among you know, all those things, you need to find ways in which those demands find some form of uh, uh, resonance and that they, they don't uh, uh, oppose uh, each other in a specific conjuncture. You know, and I think, for instance, what's important in general uh, is to create, because obviously, demand of feminist uh, uh, immigrants, they, they are, uh, they do not necessarily convert. This is why, for instance, why I disagree with the strategy of art and negri, the multitude. For them, the multitude necessarily has got some unity. You know, and I say, no. There are conflicts, but those conflicts, uh, we need to find ways in which a certain crucial moment, people are strong enough to unite, to, for instance, bring down neoliberalism, create the condition for uh, uh, the development of radicalization of democracy. So there is a moment in which the different group, you know, although they don't agree on everything, act together, but of course, after that, you know, you are going to have to accept that there will be a lot of conflict. So the moment of unity is just one uh, step or, 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 or time in a, wide, a bigger strategy, because a pluralist uh, democracy, of course, and obviously, you know, a strategy of left populism is the establishment of a pluralist democracy, a, a real pluralist democracy. Um, will not eliminate conflict. And it's not a question of articulating them, uh, the demand in such a way that they would never conflict anymore. It's articulate them in a way in which at some point, some crucial moment, they can unite 
in order to have a co common objective. And once this objective is, is reached, then of course the struggle and, uh, b begins again, you see? But you can't predict in, in advance what's going to happen. Wow. <laughs> I think we can continue yeah. for hours and hours, but we really have to stop. And I think yeah. we also are in need of a drink. So uh, please continue this discussion uh, at the bar or in the restaurant. Um, but please first give a very warm applause for Alicia Bichica and Shannon.